Well, what a great afternoon so far, and thank you to Peggy for ordering, and the Broadmoor. Of course, we'll thank the Broadmoor for the snow. <laughs> Did you all get out and get some photos? I had a laugh because I do live in Minnesota, and the snow has been so forthcoming this year that it is taller than my mailbox consistently. It's just starting to melt now. So Fran even came back to me in the back, and she knows I've been talking about the snow all year, and said, Jenny, you got to go out and look at the snow. It's so pretty. <laughs> and I have to say, it is a beautiful snowfall. So I am so excited about our next presenter and to be able to have Lauren here today for our leadership conference. I have the opportunity of going on the road with Lauren and Fran and Bonnie Buckheister as we do our rocket programs and we've been in many of your cities. And I have to tell you, Lauren has truly become a friend over the years and <laughs> He is beyond a wealth of knowledge. Um, every time I'm with him, I have to pull out something to write on because he's giving me some nugget that's either going to save my life or is going to save cybersecurity or help me put some protection on my 10-year-old daughter's cell phone that she's getting for her birthday. That's, that was this morning's conversation. So, um, Lauren is just a wealth of knowledge. He is passionate. He cares about HSMAI and the chapters. How many of you have had Lauren out to a chapter? I know he's done for a couple chapters in the room. And once you agree that Lauren, yes, you just, I, I say, Lauren, can I just take you and your wife, Renee? Um, I'll come to your place, because you live in the Fort Myers area, much better than Minnesota. Lock ourselves into a room for a week, and I'm just going to start typing, because he is so full of information and just a lovely person to be around. And so I am so excited to have him here with you today. So as you see, chapter, no chapter. We decided chapters, right? So then we moved into, okay, now that we're doing chapters, and we decided we're going to continue to move forward with chapters, how do we create that member value proposition? How do we tell that story? How do we get, you know, what we know, how do we put it in ways that we can bring out into the community? So that's why we have this next session with Lauren, and he is here to help us with that um, and help us on social, all things social and marketing. So with no further ado, Mr. Lauren Gray. <laughs> because uh, I'm trying to always, always put too much into a short period of time. Uh, the objective when Fran and Jenny and, and the team came to me and asked, can you focus on what the chapters need to know and how they can improve their place in their market, how they can be better at being chapters in their market. And I took a bit of an interesting twist to it. Um, what I thought about was not so much the semantics of the chapter, and we've gone through a lot. Uh, Peggy did a wonderful job going over through the challenges and the things that you face in your, your volunteerism to the chapter, the obstacles that you have within the chapter, your participation in the chapter, the goals of the chapter. But more so, the, I want to focus on the opportunities that you represent. Um, old school, raise of hands. Do you have a business card that you made specifically for your relationship with HSMAI? Your chapter role? One, two, three, four, five. It's a powerful tool. You have a get out of jail free card to go into anybody's door in hospitality with the excuse, this is who I am. Not from the job that you run, but from your relationship with HSMAI. I want to put that in your head initially to think about this, because what I really want to talk about is this process we're going to go through. This is the stage we're going to go through today. I'm going to try to keep it segmented with the opportunity for feedback. This isn't a own presentation as much as I have to talk about things. It's a question and engagement process. I do have some tools. Not like pulled everywhere, but it's called Mentimeter, same thing, different story. It'll create word clouds for us that we can engage with. I don't want to spend too much time with it because we can get languishing in that rather than the context of tools and techniques. I really want to give you working methodologies about how to improve using things like social media in particular today with what you need to do with your chapter. So this is the process. What we're going to talk about is branding to being an icon. 
Now we're familiar with branding, we hear about it all the time. Personal branding, corporate branding, branding entities. Brand is one thing. Brand is a representation of a name, uh, an uh, identifier. What I want to talk about is becoming an icon. And we'll get to that. Then we're going to talk about a little bit about are we aware of what we're really dealing with, the technologies that are out there. I was told very clearly that we have a very mixed group, we'll get to that question as well, of people that are engaged in different professions within our industry. So are we really aware of the technologies that are out there and the influence in our lives that they represent? Then, of course, uh, what can you do with all of it? What are some of the methodologies that you can do with these platforms, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the LinkedIn's, and so forth of the world? And then, really the fun part that I want to spend the most time with is how to make all of it work. How to use the tools, the process that you need to look at, how you start from somewhere to get to somewhere else. Okay, so that's our methodology. What I like to do is, I have this as instructions. This is our first interaction, so we'll get warmed up with the idea of this. If you can go and take out your phones, your laptops, iPads, whatever, if you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, You'll be placed a little bar that says enter your code. The code is 534856, you can see it on the screen. Just indicate a sense of what your current job profession, your engagement is at this point, whether you be student, whether you're administration, corporate, revenue management. To get a sense of where we can lead some of the conversation, where some of the gap points are for us. Now for those that received the email for the predication, I did have a free workbook. Thank you so much. I think a little over 40 of you participated with that on uh, engagement. I hope the questions were challenging or interesting. From the responses that I got, there were some good things that we can point at later on in the conversation as to answers to some of them. Please make sure that if you have particular uh, answer, questions you wanted answered from that pre-survey. So primarily we're looking at sales, strong revenue management, operations and marketing, goods a dose of students, corporate, but really strong on the sales side. Okay, good, okay. Thank you. We'll have a couple more of those. They won't be, we're not gonna get them in the way of clutter. All right, what are these? Brands. Logos. Logos. Oh, logos, yeah, good point. <laughs> Never thought about that one. Just when you think you got it down. <laughs> <laughs> They're icons. Why are they icons? They're known all over the world. They've transcended their product to represent a lifestyle. There's people that tattoo those logos on their butt. <laughs> There's a few more logos I'm gonna throw in there, I guess, but I'm looking at Harley Davidson. I don't know about Nike, but I'm actually I can see myself doing that. But anyway, so <laughs> they're icons. Icons are transcended what brand is. An icon is someone or something, I need to read this up. It's not the product anymore. It's what you represent, what the product represents, a lifestyle, a concept. I propose to you that everyone in this room can translate their chapter into what it means to be an icon. That you are the authority of the industry in your market. Hands down, flat down, unbiasedly, the authority. Because anybody else you talk to, be it a vendor, a company that you work for, whatever, has a different purpose to their being in that market. They're going to tailor their message to what the corporate offers. They're going to tailor the message to their product. But to be an icon means that you represent the industry, the unbiased available resource of what hospitality is in your market. Whether you're a housekeeping wannabe, a front, end, a front desk agent, a bartender, or a salesperson, whatever it is, you can represent the industry. And that's what we're going to talk about how you can create that messaging, the content, and the methodology to get that message out so that when you walk into a room or walk into a company that you're looking to engage with for hospitality, they're like, wow, opportunity. I have an opportunity to touch the icon of what hospitality is in my market. So, we already blew past the first segment. Second segment. By the way, I threw those things in. If you are in social and you like playing with things like that, HSMI, of course, is our, our tag, which was a question I put into the pre, and I uh, want to point back to that. We got a lot of answers to that question, but not a lot of them were the right answers. We're looking to establish what your page names were 
if it was on Facebook, what your Twitter handle was, if it was on Twitter, and what your LinkedIn page was, if it was on LinkedIn, because we do not use the resource we have in this room. We were brought up in our conversations earlier today when we were talking with Peggy. We don't create, what, what's the definition of viral? What's, what, what, how does something become viral? Meaningful. Yes. Number of hits. What's this? Number of hits. Number of hits, engagement. I was asked that about when I used to work for a large company, um, how do we get viral? And I didn't have an answer. It boils down to people share things because it makes them look good, it makes them feel intelligent. I gave you an interesting stat in our conversation. 64% of the people will share a piece of content before they even read the content, just because it makes them look good. Oh, I know such and such is gonna love this. And that's why there's such things as clickbait, BuzzFeed, and all this other stuff that's out there that the headline looks great, but the meat behind the bone isn't really there. Making something viral is that spread of content that is relevant, but it's about the spread of content. Well, in our world, we don't share that with all these chapters. Do you know in this room right now, everybody's chapter handle on Twitter? Do you share what they share? Do you like what they share? Do you post and comment on? If you add it, and I have the numbers in the questionnaire, let's do a quick piece of math. If everybody, the industry, the world average for Facebook is that everyone has 300 followers, okay? Say there's 100 people in this room. What's the math for that? 300,000, right? Next degree of separation. Everybody that we know has 300 followers. 300,000 times 300,000. You see how this can multiply. Facebook says that the degree of separation, remember you know, the, the, the six degrees of separation, is less than three at this point, it's 2.98. The distance between us and anyone else that uses the internet right now. So if you multiply out the number of people that all of us know, and just the people that they know, and put it in the American Airlines for the Dallas, okay? And let's say that half of the people we already know, so it's down to say half a million people that are new, that are all unique. Out of that half a million people, if we say something, only half of them are gonna to listen to what we have to say. That's down to 250,000. Let's say half of those people, even though they hear what we have to say, won't actually act on it. So now we're down to 125,000. That's still more than what's in American Airlines are gonna hold. Now let's say we cut that in half and say, even though they'll listen to us, even though they may do what we ask them to do, will they actually tell somebody else about it? Cut that in half, that's 75,000 people. That is still less than the number of people that we can connect right now from the people in this room. But we don't use that power. We don't share that networking capability of liking what our, our other fellow chapters do. We don't share what our fellow chapters do. Why we invent the wheel every day with content when another chapter may have a wonderful piece of content that you can share from them? We'll get to that. So, I wanna play this video. Some of you have seen it. And those who haven't, I hope you enjoyed it. It's about six minutes. We'll try to keep it. If you are sitting in the United States or Europe right now, you've probably never used a Chinese app. But the reality is, if you want to know how the internet will develop, China, the land once known for its cheap ripoffs, has actually become a guide to the future. You know, the internet is the internet. But for China, the internet is more like an intranet. It's largely walled off from the Western world by this incredibly complex system of filters and blocks that we call the Great Firewall. And basically, the Great Firewall blocks any foreign site the Communist Party doesn't need to control. So that means there is no Facebook, no Twitter, no Google. Instead, what filled the internet vacuum was a generation of Chinese copycats that have grown into huge companies. So for Google, you had Baidu. For YouTube, you had Yoku. For Twitter, you have seen a label, and the list goes on and on. It's almost as if the Chinese internet is a lagoon that's in the side to the greater ocean of the internet. And in that lagoon, there are these swamp monster apps that bear some resemblance to the creatures in the ocean, but are mutated in some ways because they evolved in a different kind of environment. But things have started to shift in the sense that before, no one outside of the lagoon really cared about the swamp monsters. But now, all of a sudden, some of the features they've developed are so amazing that Western apps are trying to copy them. And the greatest example of this is WeChat. WeChat is an example of, uh, for lack of a better word, a super app. It's a Swiss army knife that basically does everything for you. 
It's your WhatsApp, Facebook, Skype, and Uber. It's your Amazon, Instagram, Venmo, and Tinder. But it's other things we don't even have apps for. There are hospitals that have built out full appointment booking systems. There are investment services. There are even heat maps that show how crowded a place is, be it your favorite shopping mall or a popular tourist site. The list of services goes on basically forever. But it's not the variety of things you can do on WeChat that makes it so powerful. It's the fact that they're all in one app. So why does that matter? Hypothetically, imagine you're sitting at home and one day you notice your corgi is dirty. You open WeChat, hit a few buttons, and a few hours later a man shows up at your door with some shampoo and a big bag. Your dog gets clean and he looks great. You take a photo, you share it with your friends, and tag the dog in the business. You haven't left yet. Your friend who likes Hello Kitty and works a boring office job is slacking off of work and looking at WeChat. She sees the photo of your clean corgi. She decides she wants her poodle clean. She clicks the tag on your photo and orders the same service. Within seconds, the man with the big vacuum is on his way to her house. She pays him, and he's happy because he got paid instantly on WeChat. She starts chatting with you to thank you. Neither of you have left the app. While chatting, she tells you about a new hip noodle joint. She says, you have to come. It's a schlep, but you accept it. She orders food while still at her desk. You order a taxi. She pays for the food. On the way to her house, the man with the big vacuum invests the money he earned from both of you into a wealth management product that's probably a little too risky. Neither of you, nor the man with the big vacuum, have left the app. Both of you arrive and the app tells the kitchen you're there. Your WeChat profile photo pops up on the mural. It's an old photo from the year you had that weird partner here. Of course she makes a comment. Your food is served. You notice your meat is a bit overcooked, so you snap a photo and post a disparaging restaurant review. You're already on your phone, and you remember you still owe your friend money because she paid to transfer her money. Neither of you, the man with the big vacuum, nor the restaurant have left the app. At the restaurant, there are no menus, there are no waiters, there is no cashier. There is only WeChat. By rolling so many functions into one single app, it's altered the concept of virality. It's no longer just videos or images or tweets that can go viral. It's a dog washer, noodles, all sorts of companies and products that get the push of a social network. Here in China, that network is 700 million people. Sounds great, right? Well, it is, but using a single app to find a date, schedule an oil change, or notarize a document also enables WeChat to collect a staggering volume of personal data. They know what you talk about, who you talk about it with, what you read, where you go, why you're going there, who's there, how you spend money when you're online, how you spend money when you're offline. The list goes on indefinitely. For advertisers, this is a miracle. It's the combined data of Facebook, Amazon, Google, and PayPal, all in one place. The problem is, all of the data is information Chinese companies are forced to share with the Chinese government, which has a long record of human rights violations, and isn't exactly shy about stalking its citizens. So if you're not in China, why does this matter? It matters because we're starting to see a number of Western tech companies attempt to replicate super apps like WeChat. For the companies, it's incredibly powerful. And for you and me, it's convenient and even transformative technology. But of course, it could also be problematic. Concentrating so much data in so few hands could lay the groundwork for an Orwellian world where companies and governments can track every single movement you make. I want to show that to you because I have a pleasure and I do have clients in China and if you've ever been to China and used that, it is a amazing, like, oh my gosh, there's nothing else I have to have on my phone. It literally does everything. What came out of it for us in, in the Western world? I mean, you saw it in no shy instance to the fact of uh, Messenger and so forth with Facebook, but what came in the Western world for us? I mean, not to get into the te technical side, but laws and rules that have changed for us recently? Yeah. GDPR. If we were good marketers, we wouldn't have rules like GDPR, but we are using data. And that's literally what they're saying that WeChat has, has to do with the Chinese government, is that when you put all that into one location, there's an opportunity for abuse. Data is power, data is the currency of what goes on. We won't get into that conversation too much today, but I want to make sure that we have, whoop, whoop, right, there we go. All right, point to the process. All those who have iPhones, please take them out. And for those who don't have iPhones, just look at your iPhone friends for a second. We have a video for you in just a moment for those Android friends. All right, for iPhone, if you would, I'm not gonna to try to read this faster than you can read it, 
but please, we follow the instructions. The first person that gets to the place that is at the bottom of this, there's a little scrolling involved. Please raise your hand because I'm going to ask you what it is that you're looking at. And for those just to see, we're asking you to open up your settings, your location. Now, Tim at Apple has said that the data on your phone is yours. It is not shared. What do you see when you get all the way to the bottom of it? Uh, farther down, keep going, because there's a there's a map and there's going to be some numbers and balloons. Yes. Oh, Where have you been? Ever. 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 And how long you were there? Ever. <laughs> Do you remember those old pictures where it says this phone has replaced the following things and shows video cameras and GPSs and all that stuff? Your phone keeps all this data. It knows barometric pressures and altitudes and locations. Now, Tim says that this data is on your phone and that it's not being shared, but it is certainly being used. Okay? So, with that in mind, for our Android friends, I give you this video. We know that Google is tracking us. We agree to it when we set up our phones. So, we wanted to figure out what exactly Google is learning about us throughout the day. So, here's what we're going to do we have two identical phones. The only difference between these two phones is this one is an airplane mode. Both of the phones lack a SIM card, and they haven't been set up to access any Wi-Fi networks. So for all intents and purposes, these phones have no connection to a data network. We're going to keep them with us throughout the day. And while I travel around DC, we're going to figure out just what Google is finding out about me. Our first stop, Sims Convenience Store, just outside of Fox Bureau, for a quick coffee. From there, we took a walk to the Capitol and took a quick walk around the Senate office buildings and then decided to hop in a car and head around town. Hello. We'll go to the Children's Hospital, please. To run our test, we had to do more than walk a block, so we took a tour around our nation's capital. First, due north to the Children's National Medical Center Hospital, then west to St. Albans School and the National Cathedral. Our tour around town was a 14-mile journey that lasted more than an hour. The entire time, the phones had no access to the internet, oh my goodness. not a Wi-Fi connection, and not any cellular data service. It almost seemed quaint to assume that Google wouldn't even be able to collect data on me. Let's head back to the Bureau, my friend. Oh, that church is beautiful. Google's business model is simple. Collect data on its users and then use that data to sell targeted ads. It's a business model called surveillance capitalism. But does that critical data collection work even when your phones aren't connected? So we're back here at our Fox Bureau in DC and we've got both of our phones exactly how we left with them. The only difference really, I snapped a couple of bad selfies at the National Cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, they have stayed in my pocket for the entire day. So let's find out what they know. This is our man-in-the-middle device. It's basically a Wi-Fi network that these phones are going to connect to once we turn their Wi-Fi on. It's going to pass data through it on the way to Google. But on the way, we're actually going to get a copy of the same data that Google's going to get. We'll be able to decrypt it and then find out where we've been throughout the day. Within minutes, the numbers rolled in. The phone that wasn't on airplane mode registered more than 100 locations, 130 activities, and even 152 barometric readings. As soon as it hooked up to our Wi-Fi, it transmitted 300 kilobytes of data straight to Google. The phone even logged our exact locations, tracking us all around town, the capital, the hospital, the school, and the cathedral. Now you may notice what's missing here is the exact route that we took but it got that data too. It knows when I got out of the car. The metadata has a time lock down to the very second, tracking everything when they think that you're walking, riding, and yes, even getting out of the car. Okay, so you're thinking, this isn't a big deal. I'll just put my phone in airplane mode. Yeah, we thought of that too. This is the other phone that we had with us that no SIM card also remained in airplane mode the entire time. Let's see what kind of data it captured. The phone with airplane mode activated actually logged more locations and activities than the other phone, and it also transferred hundreds of kilobytes of data to Google as soon as it was activated. The only thing that's missing from this map is our stop at the Children's Hospital, but it still knows we were there. There it is. Exiting vehicle, 100% accuracy. Through complicated user agreements and free software, Google gets users to sign away their privacy for nothing. They're even following you in the places that most people Sorry. People would expect total privacy, 
government buildings, a children's hospital, a private school, a church. Every move you make, every step you take, Google is watching you. We know. Okay. This point to this madness. Um, these are some scary stats. I know they're a little small to read for this, but the point ones I want to bring out for this is point number three. The average user spends 76 minutes a day, hour 16, on the top five social media apps. Does anyone want to know what Google considers the internet these days? Google, <laughs> Google. Mobile. Mobile right now represents over 56% of all traffic on the internet. It's not your laptop anymore. It's not your iTablet, or your, your, your iPad, or your tablet anymore. That's actually a diminishing in, uh, usage. It is your phone. Your phone is the internet. Google has been very clear with us. If we don't build websites for phones, they don't even rank us. If we don't do the rules according to them, because Google's world is Google, then we don't. This uh, persuasive uh, capitalism, do you know what Google, uh, the, the value that your, your data is worth per person? Any wild stats as to how much, you, uh, how much you're worth to Google? Fifty dollars. Now, you ever use the author again? No. Twelve dollars and forty-two cents. <laughs> Twelve dollars and forty-two cents. That is it. All the data you give them, the personalization that we want, the location-based services, all the things that make it all easy and fun for us, is worth twelve dollars forty-two cents. Not the reason why we're doing this, but like I said, some of these stats is scary because mobile is our life. The reason why I bring this up is because our communication capability with what we need to do, how we need to communicate, and where we need to communicate is mobile-based. Don't be distracted without the other things. Those things will happen when they sit at the desktop, but the engagements, funny side I didn't put up. Uh, text, when you got did, did I put texting up there? No. What do you think is the percentage of texts that are open from somebody? 94%. Real close. It's a great, great number saying about 98, but 94 has been an older number, so far in that range. That's powerful. That means you send something in SMS messages that there's, you have a 94% chance at least that someone's going to open it for you. But do you use SMS messaging with your notifications? <coughs> but there's tools that can do that. They can uh, augment some of the things you do. We'll get to them. Why we're making this important, I'll let you read this. I use this. This is one of the slides I constantly use over because to me it's the principle of why we do what we do and we love what we love. The paradigm of our society has shifted. Not having the white picket fence with two and a half kids, maybe it was the half kid issue, uh, is no longer what people want. They want experiences. They want to enjoy life. They want to feel and do things. This is not a millennial thing, this is not an age category thing. This is a shift, whether it was because of 2008, 2001, it's accumulation of perception. Well, everything that everybody wants, we have. Just think about even the moments we've had today. We've watched beautiful mountains coming from Florida. That's me. I just sit up and look at the window. I'm like, oh, there's mountains. Snow, things I don't have. I've had an experience. I, I mean, I'm up there with, if you look at everybody, they're up on the phones. You know, we're, we're recording this because this is an experience. I want to share with our friends. You know, look what I'm looking at. You're not. You know, that's what we do. Okay. Feedback. Now, this is where I get to go and try to school them to the other side. Me. I need to activate each time we do this. All right, let's go to a word cloud. I don't want to hang on this too long. I just want to get some feedback from what we've talked about so far. I threw a couple videos at you. I told you about the purpose of life, the meaning of life, how much you're really worth. You know, soil and green, for those old enough to remember. Uh, so here, please, if you would, go to Menti, put the code in. You should already, if you've already had it before, it's the same code. Now the new question should come up. Pop in whatever comes to mind. If you have a question, not that I don't think you're timid enough to raise a hand, if you want to post a question, if you want to post a word, we'll give it another uh, 30 seconds and see if anything pops up other than purpose. Practical application, excellent. We're going to get to that. Addiction, yes I do, but I try not to do it in public. <laughs> It is weird to see dark uh, storms. You know the, yeah, yeah Florida doesn't have those yet. Experience communication. All right, that's available for you to continue on. We have another one a little bit later for this. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna give you some very quick examples 
of the power of the tools that we're about to talk about, okay? Salespeople, this is directly related to you, okay? For those who have had this example before, my apologies, it's just such a good example, I hate to lose it. And this is legitimate, this truly happened. I had a hotel that 14 days out lost an entire weekend group block. 62% of the artists died. It was through a tragedy that happened. We had a nutrition clause, we weren't going to exercise it. They were an annual return group that came. Tragedy created the, the cancellation, but I still had a 62% occupancy, poof, gone. From your perspective, from sales, for those who are in revenue management, what are my options? Remarket. Remarket. Well, you're actually a very good answer, and yes, we're going to point out to something about that. What else? Use last sales. Sierra Mounted. Okay. Send out data to those that we know. What else? What would you say, for both circumstances, to take them both into the context, what are you going to tell them? For the retargeting or for the CRM send, the, the database send, what are you going to offer them? Discount. Go ahead, opportunity up. Bar rate, discount rate? Okay, you hang on to rate. Good choice. Some of the best answers. Where's, where's Jen? Jen? These are some of the best answers we ever got. <laughs> rock people are like, uh, well, you know, that's also because we get a lot of revenue people are like, let's reduce rate and see what we get for increased demand. Yeah, no, these are some great answers. And to your point, yes to all of them. What we did do was we went to Facebook. Now, we don't have the time to go through exactly the custom audience development program on this or not yet, but to say that there's a thing called custom audience. So what you do is you take your emails of people that you have in your database, and you load them into Facebook, and say, hey, Facebook, of the emails I just gave you, who do you know? And it'll come back with some number related to how many you sent them. From that point forward, everything about what Facebook knows about those people, well, we don't know who they are individually. We've lost that aspect of this. They've turned into an audience. But everything that Facebook knows about them is now filterable for us to go over and target with within Facebook. So what we did do was we made several custom audiences. One, we took everybody that stayed at the same time last year. Why? Because we figured if they stayed at the same time last year, they might have the same reason to stay this time this year. Two, we took a custom audience of everybody that was within a 150 mile radius. Why? We're not to get on Drive flight. market. Two weeks out, you're not gonna have somebody fly from a distant place that you're past your airline window. So the drive market was the strong one for that. We then took everybody that was on the books for that weekend. Why would you do that? Perfect. We're going to make them a negative audience so that what we're about to do, they won't see. Because one of the things about offering anything is putting money back on the table. From a revenue management point of view, you start offering discount rates, you got people that do buybacks, you lose, you know what I mean. Anyways, so we did all those things, okay? And we shoved out the group rate. To your point, I wouldn't say bar, but I did say the rate that I lost, I replaced it you know, again in the market with the same rate offering, which was not bar, but if we could replace the business, we'd be good. And the reason why I keep using this example, it doesn't happen all the time, but it did this time. We were able to replace all the business in that short window. The example that I'm making with this is that it's not about broadcasting, hey, I got a great rate and date, I got great stuff, this is an experience of a lifetime, not to say that this is a great starting statement, but you should define that statement. If this is a great experience of a lifetime, why? Is it because of the rate or is it because of the unique events that are on during that week that you have an opportunity to come to? Whatever it is, you should define your message statement, but we'll get to that as well. All right, an example of uh, stealing market share. So I had to speak at Focus Right one year, and uh, the company I worked with at the time had a hotel just up the road now. I didn't want to go over and stay overnight, especially after I found out the rate of the hotel where the focus rate was running. So I contacted the hotel, the company I worked with, to ask if they were sold out. As always, you don't want to displace revenue. And they said, why would we be sold out? Aaron. Can you go back to the previous slide a little bit? How would you do with or deal with a luxury property? I, I have a different approach here. I, I don't have Let's hear it. Some sort of disagreement. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of sales people, or professionals in the room. So I think we have to call in. I'm, I'm speaking from the revenue management perspective, right? How do you have a cut off fee or drop, you know, like 
Oh, maybe the part that I missed was the, the, the tragedy created the cancellation. We didn't have that. They, 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 somebody died. And so they had to cancel that far close. It was, it was something that wasn't, they just didn't show up or they just decided. It was actually somebody died and they replaced the event with a memorial service. So how, how did you deal with the luxury property? How to deal with it from the luxury perspective? Well, again, and I report to the fact that nothing can't be solved in this room with the intelligence we have to it. We're in a luxury property, we have some great representation. Given the same scenario, what options from the luxury? Now here's my question. What's the difference between a luxury resort and anybody else in the circumstance? Great. Oh, sorry, yes, please. Uh oh. Here we go. So we have the same exact situation, um, and it doesn't matter whether they're paying $450 a night or $250 a night, you still have a, a, a target audience that has paid $450 a night in the past, but they might be likely to come again, and you do that geo-targeting. You, you circle the market and you get close, and they, they have the ability to spend. So there's, there's really no difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we got that group back once they were able to reorganize and restructure. Um, they came back and booked with us again. So we didn't lose the future potential business by holding to our cushion policy. And that was the choice that this hotel made as well. We didn't want to lose their future. I mean, they had been a, a perpetual uh, piece of business for us for years, and we lost them through a tragedy. And we didn't want to just get short term gain for hidden nutrition and then saying, well, you know, sour grapes, they're not going to come back. Plus, there could be 250 attendees that now have a sour taste for your company. They're going to tell the 300 people that they know, and no one, you know, I mean, it's just not like this. And especially with those kind of stories to tell when tragedy hits and then you're being less than sensitive, it does have a repercussive effect to it. But I guess, Aaron, to answer your question about this, I don't know of a distinction between resort and not. Great integrity, yes, everyone has great integrity, and obviously non-resort hotels or non-destination resort hotels have a little bit more flexibility in market space as to what tier they land on. When you're on top dog in your tier, uh, you have a, a maintenance that you have to hunt and maintain for that. But you also have, and I think the answer that I, best I can suit for this is, is that through the targeting capabilities of making sure that it's not a general audience that is aware of it, it's not in your market strategy in general, it allows for the selectivity for the responses that we got, that those people who were most interested in the opportunity took advantage of it, while everyone else blindly was unaware of the fact that opportunity even existed. And also, too, to the point about the negative audience, you weren't even announcing it in your market strategy, so people would then leverage it to their benefit. So the resort thing I can see, you know, sometimes you're just gonna have to make different changes because of the integrity rates that you may have to maintain, but I think in general, the, the, the same rules would probably have to follow in that sense. Do you want to be efficient or not? What's that, sir? Do you want to be efficient? No, we didn't charge it for any attrition. Because we replaced it with a with similar business at the similar rate, we didn't, that was our, we understand statement to that. We went over and said, hey, we got this, we were able to fill this in, we didn't, and we weren't even going to even if we had to lose cost to it at that point, because again, from the repercussions, we live in the social world, which is what we're talking about. And that repercussion, that consumer sentiment could be a negative impact for you, and more painfully so than the money that you would have gained by charging them for the differences on it. Hopefully, and thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, back to this one at hand. So, didn't want to stay really expensive, competitive, uh, my uh, the hotel that was the company I was worth was at 60-ish percent occupancy, or whatever it was like that. And I said, well, what about the conference down the road from you guys? And they're like, what conference? I'm like, hey, don't you guys do reader boards anymore? Anyway, so, <laughs> I went over and did a target. I took everybody that liked Focus Right, and I took everybody that was their lead sponsorships of everyone that follows those companies, and I made a custom audience out of them. And I sent this ad out to them that basically said, sending Focus Right enjoying four diamond service, almost $100 less, because the rate that was at the hotel, the Western Diplomat in Hollywood, was $4.99. Their rack was $3.99. So we're getting rack, <laughs> not even bar. Um, just five minutes up the road, up from the beach from the conference. The results of this was we did sell off for the entire week of the event, and they got a whole mess of more followers for it. So we thought, hey, that was lightning. That happened. Wow, we did it. Two years later, Focus Rate came back, almost identical ad, almost identical results. Didn't get as many followers, because by that point, Facebook was throttling and following stuff a little bit. So targeting with Facebook, targeting with all the filters that are available for Facebook is a very powerful tool to use. Here's another example of 
more from a food and beverage point of view. This came from a hotel, excuse me, from a restaurant that just went under a major renovation, sitting on a beach. 30 years in existence, great product, well known, well established in this market. What grew up around it was 71 competitors you could walk to. It was a small town in Florida that all these restaurants and things went into. So the commodity in that market was really about where you parked. Because once you parked, you can get anywhere you wanted to go to. Well, they had a problem. Friday nights, they were losing their happy hours, and they were losing their, their live music audience later Friday night, because there were so many other choices for people to go to. So this was a, an application of old stool marketing with new technology. I used to own restaurants, and for me to get happy hours, the rule I knew was get the single girls in. <laughs> They don't like buying their own drinks, that's for sure. There's a guy's coming on there. Buy your drink. Um, back in my day, we didn't have social, so you know, you had a chance to survive here. One person stick their head in, see it's dead, tell everybody else, and nobody shows up. So what we did was we did a radius around the restaurant, okay, of uh, about five miles, and we went over and said, anybody that's female, 24 to 34, single, if you want to disrupt your family life. Okay? <laughs> and we posted it Friday at 5 when people were making those decisions, the social engagement. What do you do? I don't know. We did, we did it for that I don't know. And we sent it out with the post going and saying, hey, show this to valet in your free parking. We had 150 parking spots for the restaurant. And 545, we had to take the post down because we had no more parking spots. We had a great happy hour. And we were going to send the second post out, quarter till 10, when the live music started saying, hey, live music, show this to your free parking. We had to offer only free drinks. Why? Because we had no parking spaces. Everybody stayed. Everybody, everybody had everyone they wanted to. The girls were there. The guys were there. The music was there. Food was there. Everything was good. So we thought, oh, wow, lightning again. Anytime we wanted to do this, we thought our competition was going to figure this out. Anytime we wanted to do this. Then we started getting more filtered. We started paying for ads. We started getting anybody to work in law office. We worked in the doctor's office. We started looking at our employer base and running the market, targeting industries, targeting company names. All that is usable within Facebook. Okay? Feedback. We'll take a brief moment with this because I took a little longer on that section than I anticipated and I do not want to miss. Any feedback from what we just did? Any question comes up with it? Any comment you want to make about it? We're only going to give about 15 seconds to this one because I refuse to miss our window. Yes, sir. So, can you tie some of this to an application for driving attendance to programs? Yes. So, not just to business, but to programs, if yes. you will. This goes to being able to filter, and I'm going to show three platforms about Facebook being probably not the least productive, but not the most productive. Twitter will be the least productive. And we're going to purge through some of these as we go through. Heard guys on Instagram. Yes, but I have a caveat with that one. Fan freaking tacit. Thank you, Jenny, for posting that. <laughs> All right, we're done with this one, so let's move forward. I don't even have my phone. <laughs> Thank you, whoever put that up there, okay. So, we're gonna go straight through on how we do this. How do you do this? We talked about all the functionals and how fun it can be to do this, we're gonna actually talk about how to do this. The reason why this screen is blank, because this is where most of you get stuck. Of, hmm, okay, what? Where do I start this stuff? How do I do this stuff, okay? This is the stepping stones to this process. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. First, define what it is you're trying to do it for. I broke it down into some. These aren't inclusive, excuse me, exclusive to the list. You have basically event, you have basically membership, industry contribution, community support, membership value contribution. And that's just picking the big fruit out of the basket. There's probably more nuances and fractionalities you can create with that, but those are the big ones, okay? Once you define what of those you want to first work on, not that you don't want to work on all of them, but each of these, okay? Say, let's pick an event. Then you want to define your, your demographics. Who are we talking about? Remember one of the problems that Peggy brought up about, oh, you know, I went and I didn't attend, it wasn't, or I attended, it wasn't what we want to value, and I said it was marketing. It is marketing, because you, you, you brought the information in front of the people that really didn't want it. They just decided to come thinking it might be relevant whether it's through the communication or whether it was the targeting, but either way, they lost interest or didn't feel it was out. This is where you fix that. You define the de demographics associated with what you're trying to do. I'll keep with the event theme. So you have an event. Who do you want to have show up at your event? And you have two answers to that. Who historically has shown up to it if you've done it before? Or two, who would you like to show up if you're doing it now? That's it. Third, define your timeline for each effort. 
The event is the end of the timeline, not the beginning. It is the result of what you're about to do, not the beginning of what you start. Okay? You have choices to make with that. Where's the content being distributed? Where's everything else from? You know, what, what are you going to make? Is images? What are you going to write about it? What are you going to say about it? If you have your own website, it's going to be a page about it. How many of the chapters have their own website? Outstanding. We're going to talk about that real quick. All right? And of course, what channels we use, you may this. I do want to give you the caveat that the recording of this, the slide deck of all this, and all the links I'm about to show you will be on a link that you can go to and yank it down at will. And play it back at whenever you find it interesting. So you don't have to worry about this stuff. All this will be in there. Alright. So you start with the event, that's the end line. You come up with the creative ideas associated with the event. You then figure out what content you're going to create, and I'm going to show you some tools for that. You're then going to look at the approval process. This isn't done in a bubble. This isn't one person's effort. This is a team effort. This is your board. Who is the authority? Who is the creator? Who is the facilitator? Definitions of roles. Speak the same language, know who's doing what. Define those before you start it because it'll be chaos if you don't. Create timeline and tracking. Nothing is worth doing if you cannot track it. Go to rule. Decide how you're going to get the message out. What channels, and we'll go about the differences on them in just a second, what channels are you going to use to convey what it is for content about the event that you're going to have? Different channels have different values. Then you begin your organic posting. That's the free stuff. That's the share to your audiences, the accumulation of between you all networking. Guess what this chapter is doing compared to this chapter? Look at this, how amazing this is, or this content, whatever. Only then, if the event is worth it, would you then say I'm going to surgically place paid advertisement to augment my organic content. The reason why you do this, and very quickly, is Facebook says there's over 1,500 things you can put into your newsfeed at any one time. 85% of it is about family and friends. 13 to 15% of it, depending on who you talk to, is about viral stuff, things that are making news worthy or are being shared so much that you can share it in other people's news feeds. A fraction, almost infinitesimal, is about what you're doing on your pages, organically. Even though the people have liked it and are following it, they're not seeing it. The best way to get involved is to make sure people share it within their own content, because then it gets into that 85% category. That's where you get that engagement profile. Okay. These are the marketing resource tools. These are not, we're not going through all these, I think, but we're going to go through them categorically. Google is your powerful resource. If you have your websites that you have, you should have Google Tag Manager on it. If you don't know what that is, I'll be happy to tell you about it later. But it's like a shell that you put all these other tracking things in, so your website doesn't slow down. In there should be your Google Analytics, your Webmaster Tools, all this stuff. There's great tools that are for free. If you want to know if people are looking for Chinese options or any other event-driven kind of thing you want to, look at Google Trends. It'll actually tell you when people look for these things by date and location. It's free. So all these tools are there. LinkedIn is good for B2B. It's one of your most powerful tools, and I would actually put it in, in most circumstances more powerful than Facebook because you're able to identify people in industry by title, by location, better than Facebook, who does it by interest and demographics. Okay? If you look at Facebook, okay, just let's go back to LinkedIn. You have lots of tools in there. Uh, one of the things in the pre-book was, you know, what is LinkedIn's you know, tools and so forth, Navigator and Insights. Okay? They're, every one of these platforms will train you for free. Do not pay anybody to train you for this stuff. They are more than happy and will do it better than anybody else, third party, teach you how to use their platforms for free. Okay? Facebook, all about demographics, personas, families, engagements, interests. Twitter, all about present seven second of visit in front of me and disappears. That's where you hammer this stuff. I mean, you can put 15, 20 posts a day, same thing all the time, and nobody's going to notice unless they go to your newsfeed or your page and go, whoa, same thing. We'll get to that. Pinterest, don't mess with it if you don't have rich content and a community to talk to. If you don't have the community, don't use Pinterest. Because Pinterest is a visual engagement. Great for salespeople for smart business, don't get me wrong. We're talking about chapter news right now. Instagram, love Instagram. Gotta have a community. They gotta be interested in what you're talking about to follow what it is that you're saying. If you don't have that community engagement, you do a lot of broadcasting without a lot of engagement. Not that it isn't useful, it's just that 
it has to be useful in a certain way. Retargeting was brought out earlier, very powerful for engagement with your website. Proximity marketing, obviously if you're talking about being an icon in your market, your proximity is your geography. Isolating it out to regionality or segmentations within your proximity. You can, in Facebook, can put a pin on your competitor. I'll use this in the business sense. And you can say anybody that's within that pin, radius of either one mile, three mile, five miles, 25 miles, whatever, is in one of three categories. Either they live within the radius, they live within 25 miles of the radius, or they live outside of 100 miles of that radius, aka travel route. And you can actually target your people that are staying in your competition with any message you want. Don't do blitzes, just target your employers, target your top 10 employers, and say, hey, we're gonna offer them an employer rate of such and such, if you want to. You have this capability with things like Facebook, Twitter, even LinkedIn. CRM is very powerful, we'll mention that real quickly. Third party services are running real fast. This is an unreadable list. <laughs> These are all the tools that you'll have links to. Some are free, actually most are free, and others are paid for. This is a better color representation of them, categorized as to what they're helping you with. These are amazing tools. And Jenny can tell you that I am constantly, I, I, I download only too much software. Um, I play with all these, and we're going to go through some of the usages. But this will help you with creative design, social engagement, monitoring, tracking. Actually, you know, we're going to skip these slides, and I'm going to go over and go over to my tabs. Where's my little screen there? It's not showing sure my screen. Let's do this. Just move it. Okay. This is going to be fun. So, this is LinkedIn. Wow, this is going to be hard to do. This is not working as easily as I would want it to do. In LinkedIn, for you to go to your marketing, you go here. No. Sorry. You may not be able to do it this way. Sorry. That was going to be a little bit more visually easier than what it is. All right. And here we go to advertising. For those of you who have ever seen LinkedIn advertising, incredibly powerful to do. And it allows you to segment out by, wow, this should be easier than this. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, there we go. I'm going to turn to my tab. All right, we'll just look at through some tabs real quick. All right, so there's LinkedIn. I want to know something here. This is on Facebook Ad Measure. This is reflective of both LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you do. This goes back to a content statement. Whenever you're doing advertising, you're doing the things that we talked about where you're creating advertisement and then putting them into platforms. Taking a single ad and repetitively using it is not a good thing. Multiplying the types of ads that you create and then using them in a frequency pattern are the stronger thing to do. Okay. Maybe I wish this was easier to see. Okay, Google Analytics, for anybody's never seen it. Tremendous amount of data. This is Google AdWords. This gives you a wealth of information of what words they're using, terms they're using, times they're using it, where they're using it from. Now, I'm only wanting to make this as an exposure value because I want you to see there's a tremendous amount of data that's available out there, including a blank screen. Here we go, okay. Some of, you, some of the research tools. Oh, I wish I could see that better. This is called Social Insider. Some of the things is, and this is the most important aspect of research, is rather than reinvent the wheel, steal what's being done by others right now. Social Insider is one of those tools that if you know somebody in your market is doing very well socially, or they have a great presence in the market, for any platform, be it Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you can use those tools to determine what it is that they're doing right. If this shows literally their engagement, their top posts, when they post, what did they post, what was their engagement, how was it engaged with. It's a persistent group of tools that you can actually just steal their type of business. 
This is a planning software, and these are all links that I gave you. This is a planning software called Planable. These are all the ads that were being posted right now. I think for, oh, this was ages ago. This is, there's, this you put into the platform, and this allows you to post something, and then the person that has the authority can say, I like it, don't like it, there's a spelling error or whatever, or to prove it, and then it goes out as a schedule. So this is a scheduling platform. This is a research platform. Say for instance you want to find out who in your industry is in your market. You make a list and say, okay, I want to go by company name, a job title, location. And it will find emails of everybody that works for that company and with that job title. That's free? Uh, that one is, no, that's uh, 19 bucks. This is called Albacross. You put this on your website and it tells you every company that's touching your website, company, with all the information about that company, employees, income, location. It'll tell you what they did on your website and if you click on one of those, it'll give you the emails of every uh, company that it finds in this company by title and their social links. That's called Albacross. This is an event form. You guys have an event, you probably use Eventbrite. This is one platform you don't have to pay pass-through costs. It's called event form. You put the event in there, and you don't have to pay for anything. You just pay for the transaction with your merchant account. You set it up just like event form. This is a platform, I do quizzes. I don't know whether you saw the quiz we did for this one about being revenue manager or being convergence, but you take a quiz and it scores you how well you succeeded with the answers, whether you're right or wrong. This is a platform they put there called Engage Form. You make these quizzes, and that's a part of your post that you do for your social content. That, hey, are you as smart as you think are about revenue management? Ten things up. It's nine dollars. King Sumo, one of the things I thought would be a suggestion for you guys for events and so forth, always give something away. Attend for free, sign up now. For instance, this one we did, a VIP for Miami South Beach. We had 316 contestants, but they had 1,880 entries. Why? Because every time they shared it, they got another entry. It takes two seconds to set it up. Go in, type what you're giving, the membership of or attendance of, and sign up now, no purchase necessary, and let people, and as much as they share it on their social platforms, it increases their entries. It's called King Sumo. Mm -hmm. This is a creation tool called PowTo, making animations, cartoons, it's as simple as taking a template down and typing in the letters you want or taking an image you want and dragging it in. So you make animations for content. This is where I put, you see some of the stuff I've been doing for Rock for Europe. I, I, I'm helping them in APAC with their advertising. These are all the creations we're doing, magazine covers, image ads. Nobody likes just a text statement. They like images, they like videos, they like animations. They want gifts and they want you know, those kind of fun things. This is where you make them. And it's literally a, a drag and drop. You replace the lettering that's there with what it is that you want to put in. Another example of the same thing. This is called Promo Republic. You simply type what you want in there with the links that you want in there. I know friends coming up to take No, Lauren, I'm so sorry, but we have two CEOs who are limited time and they're starting in. One minute. Okay, one minute, I got one minute. <laughs> See in the lower left-hand corner of that little bar? Steal people's content. Take content from people that are in your industry or in your market that are saying the right things so you're not constantly selling your event or selling what you want to say. Take their content and you can put your little banner on the bottom that goes to call to action. So that in this case, as they're looking at Travel Trippers uh, blog, they can also sign up for the event that you're featured and steal their content. So on and on with these things that are there, these are all tools that are there. Let me switch over back to my slide deck. So I can put a proper closing slide to it. Oh, one last thing, CRM workflow, sorry. I probably have five seconds left. CRM workflow, don't accept a single email being sent out. When you send an email, if they don't open it, send something three days later. Same content, different subject line. If they don't open that, send them something new four days later after that. That's called workflow. These are all the things that you build. These are resources. There's podcasts, there's live video shows, we're talking about the show that I do. There's podcasts of people that, that do phenomenal work. 
don't you know, look over the HSMI's blog and newsletter on a repetitive basis. There's always excellent content to that. But there's all of these are in the slide deck for you. And you don't have to do that, but I do want to make this one statement. Remember, we already have an industry on kind of icon recognized by our event. So the is an icon in our industry. And we have the privilege of being in a room that is an icon of a resort as well. So it can be done. With that, that link on the bottom, it just made a leadership bit.ly, which you showed is the, uh, our bit leads. It's just my leadership is where you'll find the recorded presentation, this slide deck, the steps, and all the ways and stuff I just showed you. I wish we had more time for q but we don't. But I would be more than happy since I want to hang with you for the rest of the day and tomorrow. Should a question come up, I'll be more than happy to answer it, and I will make sure you have all my contact information because I will always make myself available. All right? Yep. Thank you all for the time.